Hello ladies and gentlemen, Willie here. It's been quite the interesting week in Warcraft. A brand new 6 month sub mount added for retail that's caused more outcry than the norm, and for practically the entire high-end TBC Arena player base, which were reverted within the space of a few hours, Blizzard teases a new game, significant PvP changes, as well as Black Temple and Mount Hyjal dropping on Classic. We have all that to go through, so we better make a start. Tier 6, Hygel and Black Temple have just released on Classic Burning Crusade last night. Despite a bit of a bumpy launch with a few disconnects and being teleported back to Hearthstones for many, it didn't take too long before players started pouring in and doing what they do best, which is absolutely decimating the new content. European Guild Progress once again won the world first race. Tier 6 took them a little over two hours from the time of release to finish up. You could say they were a little more prepared than Raiders were back in Retail TBC, where it took the Guild Nihilum a total of 26 days to finish up the tier. As suspected, coming into Tier 6 off the back of a pre nerf Tier 5, things were going to be easier. Tier 6 only had a few bug fixes throughout its entire duration, which Blizzard have already applied. As of the time of doing this video, nearly 500 guilds sit at 14 out of 14 for the tier. Just to put it in perspective, after two resets of tier 5, there were just over 2,000 guilds that were 10 out of 10. We are already at a quarter of that, less than one day after release. So yeah, if you had issues in tier 5, tier 6 should be a much simpler set of raids to get into. A full breakdown on the raiding content will of course follow after the second reset. There's good news for new or returning PvP enthusiasts for TBC, gearing up for the new season just got much easier. Here's some notes from a recent blue post. When we compare PvE and its rewards, there's a stark contrast with the level of effort and time investment required. We attempted to address this in Season 2 by introducing PvP faction items early, a change introduced with Sunwell's release, and reducing the cost of previous season's gear by half, but we don't think those changes were nearly enough. So in addition to that, they've added all of these, which will be live now. PvP faction items now have an honoured requirement down from Revere, the battleground mark costs for season 1 gear have been removed. The battleground mark costs on Vindicator items have been reduced by half. The amount of bonus honor rewarded from marks to honor repeatable quests have been increased. The Call to Arms daily quest now provides 3 battleground marks and the bonus honor reward has been increased. The Halar and Terracar PvP daily bonus honor rewards have been significantly increased. The Hellfire PvP quests now give a bonus honor reward. And Tier 4 and Tier 5 tokens can now be exchanged for season 1 and season 2 gear at tier vendors. Now not being the biggest PvP myself but this gives many more ways through both PvP content and PvE content to gear up for the oncoming season or just catch up. And I've seen a good degree of outrage that Blizzard has changed something on the patch day that was not expected as people have just spent their marks or honor or have used their tier tokens, which I do understand, but if we all have to jump over the same hurdle just because it used to be like that, we wouldn't be getting many nice things. It's a good change for many players, let it be. Next up, the later six month mount addition to retail has caused a few more waves than normal. The trend of adding a mount for a six month sub has been going on for a good while now, consistently come rain or shine at Blizzard headquarters, so you know it's making them some good money. The latest addition is Wen Lo, who as you can see looks pretty familiar to one of World of Warcraft's rarest mounts ever. Not only that, but one of WoW's most expensive mounts ever, both in terms of gold in game and the amount for which it can be bought or traded in real life. And that of course is the Spectral Tiger. Retail is getting a reskin with some updates armor and visual effects. Classic for the 6 month in the U and NA is getting a reskin of a cooking pot, but perhaps most controversially, China Classic is literally just getting a swift spectral tiger as part of a 6 month sub, which has people upset. Now, looking into it, it appears as though China had never received the TCG event where the tigers were actually redeemable whatsoever, so this will be the first time these mounts will appear in that region. Moreover, you'll never guess what Zodiac 2022 falls on, but of course, the tiger. Right to guess, this seemed like the ideal opportunity to port this kind of mount in China where Warcraft is run by netties, but Blizzard couldn't kind of really copy paste that into EU and NA because, well, to this day a Spectral Tiger Redemption can go for over $6,000. That would be an almighty slap in the face to collectors and proud owners alike. All the same, I'm getting a nothing is sacred feeling now that this legendary mount has been re-released where it fits the timing and the dollars, anything 
is good to go. Nevertheless, the Spectral Tigers in any form won't release in Classic on EU and NA. WoW in China is run by a different company. We don't have to worry about it. For example, they got the WoW token back in Phase 2 of Classic. I think we're in the clear. Next up, just before the end of Season 2, Blizzard have swung the ban hammer with Mighty Force, banning those who were suspected of taking part in selling in-game services for real-life money. Those affected were served with a six-month break from the game. Pretty hefty. Now, you may remember back at the end of Season 1 in TBC, there was a massive volume of bans that went out, and indeed the majority of players who were eligible for Gladiator titles, and in one region, every single player who was eligible for a Rank 1 title were banned. And for Season 2, Blizz are back at it once again except this time they have literally banned practically the entire high-end TBC ladder, including many names who have competed in Blizzard events or who currently work alongside them in casting or other roles. Fortunately, the majority of the bans in this case were a mistake. If they weren't, there wouldn't be much of a high-end TBC arena player base left, and it seems like overall now there are far fewer bans than there were in Season 1. Now, whilst paying somebody in-game gold to play with your character up to a certain rating is allowed as their transaction action is purely in-game, more discussions have been popping up as of late regarding to the extent that players are using gold as a currency to unlock achievements which were primarily understood to be earned by a skill or dedication. Our current head of Blizzard Entertainment, Quick, came under fire last year for tweeting that he takes part in selling booths on retail, and one quick look at what the trade chat has devolved into on a busy retail server shows the level of competition in selling these services. Yet, it's all within the terms of service to do so, at the moment anyways. Certain booth selling organisations were investigated in the past and found to be actively converting gold into real life money, and I can't help feeling as though these methods of making gold is pushing it so much further than it has has ever been before on both retail and classic. Multiboxing was finally banned a while back for example. This was deemed too game breaking to continue despite it being something which gave Blizzard extra sub money, just as selling boosts will do because people will buy WoW tokens to redeem for these in-game services. And I'm not sure the problem with selling in-game services is so much about how far it's gone, but how difficult it would be to actively police transactions between players, as in what's a normal trade and what's the trade for a service. Maybe this thing deserves a bigger topic but let's move on for the time being. Lastly then Blizzard dropped a teaser for an early stage of a project for an unannounced survival game, a genre Blizzard has yet to properly look into and one with plenty of highly successful IPs across a range of different environments from Minecraft to Subnautica, No Man's Sky, Valheim and so on. It kind of feels it's all been done and if anything you should expect Blizzard to do something which is rather similar to what already exists but more polished and casual friendly. This has always been their MO, or has been up till recently anyway. The majority of their ventures into new games in the past have been massively successful. Earthstone for online card games, Overwatch used to be a massive hero shooter before they just kind of went AFK on the whole project whilst developing Overwatch 2 several years ago, and new IPs have since taken over such as Valorant. Every genre of gaming definitely has its day. I think we're still in the time of Battlegrounds being at their peak, but Blizzard already have that among their very various titles and it's under Activision's Call of Duty. I do like a good survival game though so let's hope it's released and maintained in a way which can show a change in culture at Blizzard following its takeover from Microsoft. That's about all though, a pretty busy week in Warcraft after all. As always thank you all so much for watching and listening in and I shall see you all in the next one very soon.